As you glide, bird, relax by the comfort and luxury of your Lufthansa flight, suddenly ships appear beneath your plane. And more ships from every part of the world. For this is the phosphorus that separates the tip of Asia. Here, too, is the fabulous city of Istanbul, where you can see more than 400 mosques. Some are tiny, but many are large, like this giant called the Magnificent. You can see colorful bathing pools for relaxation and find new homes. fan-shaped outdoor theaters, and the imposing Hilton Hotel with its sparkling green pool and skillful landscaping, and modern living at many levels for the Turks of today. Your Lufthansa plane floats gently out of the sky towards a great new airfield with straight, accurate runways that stretch for thousands of feet. Gracefully, the ship approaches with her wheels extended, coming in lower and lower for a perfect three-point landing, so smooth because of the world's most skillful pilots. Precisely on time, you disembark at Turkey's finest airport station where an attractive Lufthansa hostess makes your welcome warm and pleasant. Eye-filling Turkish hotels, like the Divan, make you feel right at home. On their balconies, you can sit for long hours with breathtaking views of the Bosphorus, where the ever-changing scene is made exciting by swarms of ships coming and going in this most beautiful of all seascapes. On the hill above, the Hilton Hotel stands impressively against the skyline, honeycombed with balconies from where its guests gaze out over the rose trees to the blue waters of the Bosphorus. Inside full-length glass, Lovely girls in traditional dress serve you Turkish coffee or finest tea. You should start your visit at Taksim Square. Here stands Kemal Ataturk, George Washington of Turkey, who made his people free. Taksim Square is really a circle in the center of the city. The square is to our right, leading to the western and more modern Istanbul. To the left begins the fabulous main street called Independence, where exciting life vibrates 24 hours of the day. We must eat at Pandeli's, located in the spice market, where we can enjoy sweet, tender lamb chops, or a Turkish specialty, doner kebab, a vertical cylinder of beef broiled with charcoal the meat is sliced from the well-done surface into a cut-out scoop and served in generous portions, so tender and so finely sliced that everyone can enjoy its delicious flavor if they can hold on to it. No, those are not tiny frankfurter hors d'oeuvres. They are sweets. These and almond cakes and so many others make your mouth water with goodness. We must be sure to visit famous Robert College, started by American missionaries more than a hundred years ago. And the Istanbul University in the heart of the Latin Quarter, whose teaching ranks high in educational standards everywhere. We must see St. Sophia, known as the world's greatest Christian edifice and built by Justinian who ransacked the whole Roman world for its treasures. So many treasures are here, like these Christian mosaics from 1320, considered the world's best and just recently uncovered. 
perhaps most of all, the Blue Mosque, which exemplifies the great contribution of the Turks to architecture and its delightful gardens. The Times Square of Istanbul is the Galata Bridge where teeming international masses rub shoulders every hour of the day and night. In five minutes, for five cents, you can ferry to Asia, where successful Turks build modern homes in which to relax and surround them with colorful gardens of flowers and of palm trees. No city in the world has more exciting nightlife than this, where the mystery of the East meets the excitement of the West. Here, in perfectly designed outdoor theaters, we may see the astounding folk ballet of the new African Republic of Ghana, fresh from Paris. Or, in the most seductive of nightclubs, we will be sure to see the belly dance, a demonstration of muscular skill for which the Turks are world famous. Ankara was the home of Ataturk, father of the Turks. He lies buried with great honor in an impelling mausoleum of native stone which took nine years to build. He made this city, built ages ago by King Midas, a city of tomorrow, with many acres in the center as a youth park, with unusual falls of water for all to relax, and where ageless children may ride fancy miniature trains. The countryside in Turkey is amazing. Great fields of wildflowers aflame with color, the government is building oases where tourists may rest in lovely surroundings and be refreshed. They are also building a brand new type of highway motel where meals are served out of doors. These are for foreign tourists and for very attractive Turkish people. In the ancient city of Eskashir, another fine Hilton hotel is nearing completion to offer the very best in tourist accommodation. Eskashir has most of the world's deposits of Mirsham, and its men have developed great skill in its carving. Holding the stone with their stocking feet, they cut it with saws into sizes just right for carving into gifts for tourists. Mirsham is moist and fairly soft when first mined, but in sunlight, it becomes hard and dry like ivory. These men produce brooches and earrings and jewel cases and strange Turkish pipes carved with the heads of sultans and cigarette boxes so delicate, yet sold for so little after weeks of artistic work. Bursa was the capital of the Ottoman Empire before Istanbul, and like most great cities of the world, the center of religious worship stands out. So does the green tomb of Mehmet I, so fascinating, with its eight sides covered with the finest Kataya tile. Inside, the Sultan's jaunty turban looks upon very fine calligraphy and the tomb of his son. Typical of Turkish culture is the honeycombed arch over doorways, which here decorates the mosque of Mehmet I, where the minaret, like everywhere else, represents a cypress tree, and the imam calls all to worship, even little children with brilliant eyes and serious gestures. He tells you that you must remove your shoes before entering the sacred interior. This is in reverence to God and to protect the handmade rugs worth thousands of dollars on the floor. Some carry their shoes inside and place them in the niches while they go to prayer. 
Muslim worship prevents waist problems when you bend at the middle with your knees straight and makes the body and the spirit humble when you touch your head to the floor. The calligraphy here is fine enough to incite the imagination of connoisseurs. It is the picture writing with Arabic symbols. In the center of the mosque stands a freshwater fountain that refreshes all who drink, even visitors. And to the rear is a side niche covered with rugs, too, with walls lined with finest tile, where color and design intertwine into eye-filling effects. The chandeliers are so graceful and delicate, you will want to bring them home. And the lace-like dome far above is a masterpiece of loveliness. Bursa produces most of Turkey's famous towels. Designs are simple, and the towels so very soft to tender skins. Ismir, the pearl of the Aegean, was the Smyrna of biblical times. Here Homer, who wrote the Iliad and the Odyssey, was born. Here today, you find hand-painted shoe boxes whose brass caps cover the dozens of ingredients with which your shoes are made to look like new. Tea and coffee are served everywhere by boys on typical Turkish brass trays. Turkish tobacco is smoked by Turks through glass water pipes called Narjila, giving them a much more effective filter than any cigarette. Tea is always taken in this shaped glass and with only a lump or two of sugar, that's all. In the center of Izmir stands one of Turkey's loveliest water fountains. And a very tiny mosque like a gem in a golden city. In every region of Turkey, men perform traditional dances to the mysterious music out of the past, like these at the Black Sea. A kementia, or Turkish fiddle, and their own voices help to provide the sound to which they dance so vigorously. and so much more you can enjoy when you fly with the comfort and luxury by Lufthansa to see the fabulous mystery of modern Turkey. The Dardanelles, Turkey's historic waterway, link between east and west fought over centuries ago by ancient powers and in our own times by modern powers. Turkey, linchpin of Middle East strategy, with the Mediterranean on one side and Soviet Russia on the other. Turkey has cradled much of the history of kind. Here ruled the Hittite kings 2,000 years before Christ. Here stood Troy, the city which fell to the subterfuge of the wooden horse. These are the ruins of the Temple of Diana, one of the seven wonders of the world. Here stood the churches and palaces of the Byzantine Empire, twice sacked by the Crusaders and captured by the Ottoman Turks. The Turkey of old merged into the Turkey of today, the cosmopolitan Turkey the tourist knows. ruins of 
of Byzantium, the mosques, the sunlit courtyards, the bazaars, And then, what is perhaps the true heart of Turkey, the wide sweep of the Anatolian plains with its flocks and herds. The cornfields, the orchards and vineyards, the peasants, the fishermen, the shepherds. This is the Turkey in which Kemal Ataturk, 30 years ago, began his social and political revolution one of the most remarkable the world has seen. In 1950, this revolution culminated in free elections fought principally between the People's Party, led by President Ismet Inonu, and the Democratic Party, whose strength lies in the new middle class. passed peaceably to the Democratic Party led by Kalal Bayar. Under the inspiration of Kamal, Turkey had made changes in 30 years more drastic in some ways than in the previous 700 years, notwithstanding that the rise and fall of the Ottoman Empire had been almost as spectacular as that of Rome. This Ottoman Empire was born at Bursa in Asia Minor in the 13th century. It succeeded by war and conquest. At Kosovo, it defeated the Slavonic kingdoms of the Balkans. Later, it captured Constantinople and smashed the Byzantine Empire. The present supplanted the cross. Before the time of expansion was finished, the empire had laid siege to Vienna. Under Suleiman the Magnificent, last of the great sultans, this empire, which 300 years earlier had been a tribal kingdom, now stretched from Hungary in the north to the Arabian Sea in the south, from the Caspian Sea in the east to Algiers in the west. It ruled millions of people, both Christian and Muslim, and so far as territory went, was the greatest empire of its time. This mighty empire, cruelly oppressive, now began its decline and fall. In a series of wars, the Christian powers crippled Turkey on sea and land. Within her borders, oppressed Christians rose in revolt By the beginning of the 20th century, she'd lost most of her European possessions. In the war with Italy, Tripolitania was taken from her. A coalition of the four Balkan kings defeated her on the eve of the First Great War. These defeats brought about a revolution inside Turkey. The revolt of the young Turks led by Enver Pasha against Abdul Hamid II. By 1914, three centuries after Suleiman, undermined by bad government and disastrous wars, Turkey had shrunk to this. But the young Turks were no wiser than the old Turks. They led their country into the Great War on the side of Germany against the might of the Allies. The outstanding incidents of the campaign are still remembered. The break through the Dardanelles by German warships. The Gallipoli campaign. The revolt in the desert led by Lawrence of Arabia. Allenby's sweep through Syria and Palestine. the entry of Allied fleets into the Dardanelles and of Allied troops into Constantinople. Sultan Mohammed VI, last of the Sultans, signed an ignoble peace treaty, but not all Turkey accepted it. Kemal, then military commander at Erzurum, did not accept it. He raised a standard of revolt both against the Allies and the Sultan and after a successful campaign known as the War of Independence, faced the Allied troops in Istanbul itself. The upshot was a new peace treaty negotiated by Inyonyu, Kemal's right-hand man, which gave the Turks better terms. It did more. It opened the road for the creation of modern Turkey.
It was this ancient Turkey on which Kemal had to build, a Turkey still dwelling in the Middle Ages, in which women were veiled, the church dominant, corruption commonplace, science and mechanical industries almost unknown, and the elementary rights and interests of ordinary people mostly ignored. By contrast, Kemal's Turkey was to be, as he said, republican, nationalist, populist, state socialist, secular and reformist. He renounced all claims to territories formerly held by Turkey, but inhabited by non-Turkish people. This then was to be the new Republic of Turkey. Among the first reforms, Kemal abolished the Fez, which he looked on as a symbol of hatred of progress. He gave women civil rights, which encouraged them to unveil themselves. He abolished the Arabic script and introduced the Roman alphabet, himself acting as school teacher to his family, to officials, and later touring the country with a blackboard. He reformed the legal system and made all equal before the law. The Quranic law was replaced by the Swiss Civil Code. Courts are public and open. Women act now both as public prosecutors and defending counsel, even sometimes as judges. This has advanced on most Western countries. He reformed the army. He created a one-party state. There had been no popular demand for change. He had had to create opinion rather than reflect it. His method was that of a dictator. A dictator, he said, so that Turkey would never need another dictator. But his work was not completed when he died in 1938. Kemal was succeeded by Ismet Inyonyu, his closest associate, who continued Kemal's work. In the Second World War, Turkey until 1944 was neutral. Germany, in the person of von Papen, the German ambassador, sought Turkey's favors on the one side, obtaining from her precious chrome ore and other products. Britain, America, and Russia used their influence in the opposite direction and supplied her with war material, including anti-tank guns and hurricane fighters. In 1944, Turkey broke off all relations with Germany. Finally, she had probably one to two million soldiers under arms and a large force of military aircraft. A heavy drain on her manpower and finances, although not engaged in actual fighting. What then is the Turkey that has emerged since the war? And how deep have the reforms gone that Kemal started? The outstanding fact is that in most cases, the manners, customs, clothes, and ideas of the children are quite different from those their fathers had a generation ago. The new generation could, in some ways, be said to speak a fresh language. This is due to one main thing, the reform of education, which now includes the much wider education of women, and removing education from the control of the church. In some schools, uh, religious instruction has now been reintroduced. Sports have become a feature of the people's life. Wrestling and horsemanship are always famous. Today, boxing, football, swimming and basketball are becoming equally popular. Science and arts were freed by Kemal from the restriction of Muslim dogma. Since then, the living human form and animal forms have been freely portrayed and sculptured, something that had never happened in Turkey. Today, Turkey has its Academy of Music and Drama and its Grand Opera. Classical plays and music, 
seldom, if ever, performed in Turkey 20 or 30 years ago, are now well known. Alongside this, interest in Turkish national art has revived. While it's true that modern Turkey is a mixture of the old and the new, for the first time in her history, the interests of the peasant and worker are being looked after. There is a balance kept between the rich and the poor. A striking feature of the new Turkey has been the building up of industries, which, although small compared with those of Western countries, employ today five or six times as many people as in the old Turkey. The steel industry is entirely new. The coal mines have been extended and brought more up to date. And new factories have been built for wool, paper, cement, chemicals and cotton. The state owns about three-fourths of the manufacturing industries and has a monopoly for such things as cigarettes, alcohol, sugar and artificial silk. But Turkey remains predominantly an agricultural and pastoral country. Three quarters of her 19 million people live off the land. Indeed, more land is owned by those who live on it than in any country in Europe. But the life of peasants is hard. Winters are bitter. Houses are poor. Indeed, some villages are carved out of the rocks and hillsides. A good deal of their farming is primitive. Quite often the ploughs are prehistoric and occasionally carts are seen with solid wooden wheels like those used by the Hittites. Animal husbandry tends to be neglected too. The government is endeavouring to improve farming by sending out instructors to remote villages. itself cultivates about three quarters of a million acres where the farming is mechanized. This partly to demonstrate better methods to the farming community. And it has organized centers for the cooperative use of tractors and agricultural machinery. But mechanization spreads very slowly. Turkey still has large areas that are not adequately cultivated, partly because of the lack of irrigation. Steps are being taken to improve this, but at present about one-sixth of the land is described as unproductive. Another sixth is under forest. In the past, land was recklessly denuded of timber for war and other purposes, but efforts at afforestation are now being made. Timber is one of the principal exports. Two others high on the list of exports are dried fruits and tobacco. In 1949, a 15th of Britain's tobacco came from Turkey, double the amount of the previous year. Much of this tobacco is used in Britain for blending with other tobaccos. Over a fifth of Britain's dried fruits, sultanas, raisins, figs and so forth, come from Turkey. While the Turks are traditionally good gardeners and husbandmen, there remains a lack of modern technical skill and knowledge of the help that modern science can bring. The village institutes, a most significant development, are doing important work in this direction. The directors of these institutes often create them in a very real way, putting up the buildings, developing the water supply, overcoming disease, often turning a wilderness into a farm and orchard. The chief aim is to turn out elementary teachers. 
And in doing it, the studies are divided equally between book studies and practical work. The men learning to be land workers, builders, blacksmiths and so on, and the girls busy with spinning, weaving and sewing. The need for far more teachers and technicians is one of the country's major problems. The second urgent need is for better roads and communications. Republican Turkey inherited 2,000 miles of railways and has built as much again. A further 2,000 miles are projected during the next 10 years. Of her 27,000 miles of roads and highways, only about a third are in good condition. And in making more, the machinery supplied under martial aid is of the first importance. This lack of railways and roads is at the heart of Turkey's needs. For getting produce to the ports to enable her to pay her way, to help the progress made in the towns to spread to the countryside, and to improve the country's efficiency in the matter of defence. This question of defence brings us to Turkey's greatest need of all a long and enduring peace. The straits she controls, the Dardanelles and the Bosphorus, are a constant anxiety. In 1936, the Montreux Convention allowed her to re-fortify the straits and laid down regulations governing the passage of merchantmen and warships in peace and war. In 1945, Russia asked for defense in common of the straits, generally taken to mean a request for naval and air bases in that zone. The request was refused, and the treaty of non-aggression with Russia lapsed. Turkey has a frontier with Russia 350 miles long, a frontier which has very poor communications with the heart of Turkey. Although she receives martial aid and United States military aid, Turkey has to spend, like many other countries, much too great a proportion of her budget on defense, on keeping her army, her air force and her navy in a state of preparedness. Turkey stands between East and West, a link between Europe and Asia, firmly attached to the Western powers, a member of the Council of Europe, and associated with Atlantic Pact defense plans in the Mediterranean, she is a country with whose future the statesmen of the world are closely concerned. The reforms she has carried out in the past 30 years have made her able to face her destiny with greater strength and assurance in this modern age.